Well, hi everyone. My name is Julie Garden Robinson and I'm a food and nutrition specialist at North Dakota State University Extension. And welcome to our February 20th, 2019 webinar. So you can move to the next slide, Tom. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, I'd like to invite you, if you haven't already signed up, we have some interesting upcoming webinars next week, same, same place. <laughs> uh, we'll be learning about trendy and healthy house plants from Esther McGinnis, and she's a horticulture specialist. And after that, we'll hear from Kathy Wiederholt, who's the fruit project manager, and she will be talking about cool fruits for cold climates. So if you're interested in fruit, here, here's your chance to learn more. Um, you've probably figured out how to use your Zoom controls. I have everyone in mute mode, and if you've unmuted yourself, I'll just ask you to remute yourself so we don't have background noise. But um, you can certainly type in a chat. If you have a question, I'm going to be keeping my eye on the chat box so that I can let Tom know, or he can keep an eye on the chat box as well. So Tom is okay with asking questions during his presentation. So just go ahead and type in the chat box if you have a question and he can answer them as he goes. So next one. Okay. Um, here's a big request. Uh, in order to keep these going, this, these are sponsored by a grant that I have. I ask that you please complete a real short survey. It'll come right to your inbox shortly after the presentation today. I promise it'll take you about two minutes. And to sweeten the deal, I do have some prizes. So I will be doing some prize drawings. And we have some fun things that we will send out to the prize winners. And next slide. And so that brings me to my introduction of Tom Kelb. Tom is an extension horticulturalist for North Dakota State University. Tom was raised on a farm in Minnesota where his family managed a commercial apple orchard and 15 acres of vegetables and berries. And Tom is based in Bismarck and he supports horticulture programs in the western part of the state. And he also coordinates the state's junior master gardener program. And he's the author of the NDSU Yard and Garden Report, which is a popular newsletter for gardeners in North Dakota. So thank you, Tom, for joining us again this year. And I look forward to learning more about apples. Okay, thank you, Julie. Thank you for the invitation. It's always good to participate in this Field of Fork series. And upon request, I've been asked to talk about growing apples in North Dakota. Why apples? Because... Apples are good for cold climates. Yes, I, someone from Arizona, sorry, you cannot grow apples as good as we can in North Dakota. The cool temps give us better quality apples. And it's a hardy crop. It's a popular crop. And it's a crop that's in demand. Um, even there's a, a, a booming cider industry begging for apples in our state. And I think another important reason is because apples are delicious. I just love to grow apples. Every year when I go to our family apple farm with my kids, my parents tell me they have to, they just got to pay me for all the work I'm doing. But I just tell my parents, I just tell them that, hey, I'm the one who should be paying you. It is such a joy to be out here in the orchard with my kids and the fresh air and picking apples. Just a lot of fun to grow apples. Apples are beautiful too. In the springtime, we've got about a couple weeks when the apples are in bloom. And uh, actually this is another opportunity for like tourism, farming and how uh, spring tours of school children uh, in the spring and in the harvest season. So there's lots of opportunities for growing apples, both in a commercial setting and a backyard setting. And so we're going to cover kind of like the wide scope of it. And uh, I'll just do my best to uh, brush over a lot of key points about how to grow apples successfully here in North Dakota. To me, this is the symbol of the fruit industry in North Dakota. Uh, lonely apple tree 
in the distance suffering from winter. Yes, that's that's the apple. That's fruit growing in North Dakota. We always brag about North Dakota about our agriculture. Yeah, we're number one in sunflowers and number one in wheat, durum wheat, number one in dry beans. But how are we doing in fruits? Uh, not quite number one, um, but not quite 50 either. We're, we're charging ahead. We're about number 48 now. We have surpassed Alaska and Wyoming for fruit production, so we're on the upswing here. But it's still, we're, um, it's a tough place to grow a lot of fruits. And we don't have a lot of educational resources because it's not a major crop in our state, but one of our leading ones is this publication, Starting a Community Orchard in North Dakota, where about half this book covers about how to grow crops, and then the other half talks about how to manage a community orchard. And actually, I just got word a couple hours ago that the North Dakota Department of Agriculture is looking forward to supporting and um, a republishing of this. So we'll probably get this republished and updated in about a month from now. So that's good. As far as other educational resources, yeah, we need to rely on other states, other fruit growing states and focusing on the Midwest. And I really like the series that's come out of Wisconsin. About 15 years ago, all the fruit specialists in Wisconsin got together and decided to write publications about how to successfully grow every crop every fruit crop in the state. So there's one on apples and pears and cherries, even like currants and elderberries. But the, we're talking about apples today and I like this publication. It covers a lot about how to successfully grow apples in the Midwest and it has nice diagrams. It teaches how to prune our apple trees. It covers about how we can, um, the, the different types of pests that we have to be aware of and the time that they're going to be there and how we can successfully control them. So these are good publications that I, that I use as a resource. Uh, the, one of the leading home fruit production guys comes out of Purdue University. It's an extensive publication with excellent information on how to grow apples and other fruit crops on a small scale. And if you're on a big scale, you're going to want to know about the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. And uh, this is for commercial growers. This is a group of universities come together, pull all their resources together, and they have an updated publication every year that gives us the latest information about uh, some basic strategies of growing fruits and then detailed information on how to control the various uh, fruit pests, both diseases and insects. Uh, using uh, standard as well as organic practices. It's a good public. All this information is available for free online. Okay, let's talk about how we can uh, get started with our apple situation. And the first thing is we've got to select a good site for our orchard. And a good site will be full of sun. We've got to have at least eight hours of full sun to have a successful orchard. We want our orchard to be sheltered from the wind if possible, because you know we know how brisk those winds are in North Dakota. Winds can create a lot of havoc in an orchard. They can uh, deter pollination a little bit from the honeybee activity. I've also, I've personally experienced, you know, bushels of honey crisp apples blowing off the trees right before the harvest time, uh, really cutting into the profits at our farm because farmers, we don't, it's technically not right to pick up a fallen apple and, and sell it. Um, the winds can also dry our orchards and make our, tr our trees sweat, uh, sweat off a little bit too much. And, and you know, moisture is always critical in our dry state of North Dakota. So if possible, it's nice to be sheltered from the wind if possible. We want the soil to be well drained. Apple trees cannot sit in water. And also we want to avoid frost pockets because frost can damage our crops in the springtime, destroying our apple crop. This happened just a couple years ago. We lost many of the apples in our state due to a late spring frost. And also we already have a short growing season to begin with. If we try some late ripening apples and we get an early frost in the fall, we can lose our apple crop or at least have severely reduced storage abilities of our apple crop from fall frost. So keep it out of the low spots, keep it out of the frost pockets. 
the next choice is where we're going to buy our plants. And again, there's, there's a whole gamut of whether we're going to plant uh, three trees or 300 trees. But if we're, if we're on the small side, just our local nurseries and garden centers are a good place to go. Um, they get their trees from Bailey Nurseries from Minnesota and Jeffrey's Nurseries up in Canada. And you can contact those nurseries directly if you want larger amounts on a wholesale price. You know, Bailey Nurseries is, very com is a very common source of all kinds of nursery stock in, in North Dakota. You can order bare root trees from Jung Seed, that's from Wisconsin. Stark Brothers has a good fruit selection. If you're up there in the cold part of the northern part of the state, you may want to check out St. Lawrence Nursery. They specialize in the, some of the hardiest apple varieties. One Green World is a good source. If you want heirloom varieties, Maple Valley Orchards out of Wisconsin has an unbelievable selection available for you. And any place in the north, you'll probably have good success getting quality apple trees. When you order your trees, you got to know your hardiness zone. And you guys are all experienced gardeners. So this is just like basics 101, right? Um, we have zones three and four here. And I don't know. I don't know about this winter, but we're now, most of our state's now in zone four because we have less extreme winters than in the past. Generally speaking, for most of our state, it doesn't get colder than the balmy minus 30 degrees. And so, you know, about 90% of the people who live in North Dakota live in zone four, and we've got a lots of apple varieties we can choose from that are hardy in zone four. If you're up in zone three, you're gonna, your selections are going to be more limited um, because especially with, there's a lot of great apples that come out of the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul area from the University of Minnesota, and some of those apples would be marginally hardy in zone three. The handout that I provided has a more extensive list of apple cultivars, but here's just a few to highlight. I think as far as you want an early apple, I really like Zestar. Um, just can't beat it. It's, it's a good quality for both cooking and, and fresh eating. Duchess is probably the most popular heirloom apple. It's from Russia, and it has good disease resistance. There's a series of apples coming out now out of Canada that are very hardy, and this includes Goodland and Prairie Magic. So especially up here in Zone 3, you want to check out those Canadian apples. Honeycrisp is the dominant apple of the upper Midwest today. Um, it's from Minnesota, and it, it, like in, our per, in our, my family orchard, we charge twice as much for Honeycrisp as the other, every other apple we sell just because it's so popular. And it just tastes so good. So, as they say, explosively crisp texture. And Honeycrisp also, uh, it stores surprisingly well. Before Honeycrisp came, the number one apple of the Midwest was Harrelson. And that's still very popular. It's easy to grow apple. It resists diseases. It's a little bit tart, which makes it a, a, not ideal for fresh eating, but it really makes a good cooking apple. Those are just a few apple cultivars to highlight. There's hundreds of varieties out there. Just make sure you get one that's hardy for your area. After you pick the cultivar, you want to pick the rootstock that it's on. And this makes a big difference because the rootstock that the apple variety is grafted on, the rootstock will affect the vigor and the disease resistance of your variety. And if I can start from the bottom, the most common apple rootstock grown in North Dakota is a standard rootstock. It has uh, the rootstock of Antonovka or the Dogo crab. These, are, uh, these trees grow fully 20, 25, even taller. Um, they're very hardy. This is what we would use in zone three. But the drawback about a standard apple, uh, standard rootstock, is that one of the problems is going to be that it's not precocious. It can take like six years sometimes before you start getting decent crops. And that's why commercial orchards are more into dwarfing rootstocks. And in particular, I think for North Dakota, the semi-dwarf rootstocks, um, they're more precocious. We can start getting good crops after about four years, 
Also, they're much easier to manage because the trees only grow about 12 to 15 feet tall. Um, especially the, we look for varieties that can resist fire blight and that uh, CG30 or sometimes referred to as G30, that's one that resists fire blight and that's a hardy one for our state. There's, if, there's dwarf apples and here's a picture of a, a dwarf planting I put in in the Bismarck. Um, this is Bud 9, this is, a, from, this is the rootstock from Siberia, so it's very hardy. And these trees only grow about nine feet tall. And, but my experience has been that they're not especially vigorous. And uh, unless you really baby these trees, you may be disappointed. And these trees were not, were not really cared for that well at United Tribes. And, and we lost quite a few of them after just a few years. Um, so I especially like the semi-dwarf rootstocks. They're vigorous and precocious. Now, you notice that all these trees are staked, and that's important for anything, on a, especially on a dwarfing rootstock. And you just see we have a 10-foot tall conduit pipe, electrical conduit pipe, a three-quarter inch in diameter, and we just pound them two feet into the ground. Staking helps to prevent wind damage in our orchard. It supports the union of the graft, you know, where we graft a rootstock, to the variety or the scion is the technical term. Staked apples produce earlier and produce higher yields. <clears throat> and again, we just use standard conduit piping. And we have good success with that. Here's a close up and you can see that graft, the graft itself of the rootstock. And when you plant an apple tree, you want the graft to be a couple inches above the soil surface. And if we have the, the pipe there, that will prevent this graft from uh, snapping off in the wind, which is a problem in North Dakota. We like to keep the, the stakes on for as long as possible. It doesn't hurt the trees, certainly, but maybe some growers take them off after a few years. You'll notice that uh, the trees are mulched, and mulching is critical for uh, apple production, all fruit tree production. Um, <clears throat> how do you mulch a tree? There's the old rule of three, three, three. We want the mulch to be three feet wide, at least three feet wide, three inches thick, and you want no mulching three inches within the trunk itself. Because if you build up the mulch near the trunk, you're going to have uh, metal mice and other rodents nesting there and nibbling on the trunk, which is a killer. Speaking of killers, mulching uh, protects the tree from mowers, and mowers are a leading killer of fruit trees, of all trees in North Dakota. Uh, mulching will also conserve moisture, which is critical, help to suppress weeds, which is nice. Another nice thing I like about mulching is that it helps to uh, insulate the soil. And what it means is it takes away from those dramatic temperature fluctuations that can occur. It keeps the soil a little bit warmer in the winter and a little bit cooler in the summer. And in the early spring, it keeps the soil a little, it, it makes it a little bit slow to warm up and keeps the environment a little bit cool. And that helps prevent premature blooming, which is a, especially a problem with like apricot trees. Um, so I really, I like, the, I like mulching, very important for an orchard. At least we've got to keep the turf away from the trunk. Otherwise, that tree's going to have a hard life. When you start your orchard, you've got to make a commitment to watering your trees, okay? And so there's a lot of different rules for uh, watering young trees. One common rule is you use about 10 gallons of water per inch of caliper. And for apple trees, we usually measure that, well, we measure that just at ankle height, just a couple inches off the ground. And when you buy an apple tree, you usually buy them about a half to three quarters inch in caliper. So that'd be about five gallons to seven and a half gallons of water per week. But only if the soil needs it. We want to keep the soil moist, but we don't want that soil to be soggy. We don't want to close the air pockets in the soil because otherwise we will drown, literally drown the tree and cause it to rot, the roots to rot. So never irrigate wet soil. 
for if you're just going to have a couple apple trees, these tree gator bags are a nice convenient way you just fill them up with water and the water oozes out slowly. And another technique on the right, you can see how five gallon pails are used sometimes and you just uh, dr drill a few holes in the bottom and the water drips out. But on the right, I really want to highlight that white tree guard, which is very important for apple trees and other fruit trees. Fruit trees have thin bark and that bark is fully exposed to the rays of the winter sun and the, that the bark can get very warm when the sun beats upon it. There's no leaves shading that bark in the, in the winter. And then when the bark gets warm, it can get active in the winter. The cells beneath the bark will get active, but then when the sun sets, those cells freeze rapidly and that can cause cracking or what we call sun scald injury. I've got a picture of, I just saw this at the post office in um, Bismarck last summer. And you can see how almost every maple tree has this crack on the south or west side of the tree. And the same with fruit trees. And if you have a white tree guard, the white tree guard will help to reflect the winter sun and keep the bark relatively cool. Okay, so use a white tree guard, not a black tree guard. We want to reflect the winter sun. Also, the tree guards can also help suppress another friend in the orchard, voles or meadow mice, which cause major damage. It's fruit trees, they just love fruit trees. They'll bite off the bark and they'll girdle the tree. They can kill the tree. So look out for voles and always keep your orchard well or your lawn area well, uh, well mowed right before the snow comes to minimize the amount of vole nesting habitat. The other type of critter we got to worry about in apple orchards are deer. And I can just tell you my own experience when I, when I, was, when I planted the, the apple orchard at United Tribes, I put in about 40 apple trees. And within two days, every apple tree was pruned by deer. Everyone, everyone. They just love fruit trees. There's just the sweetness and the taste of that bark is delicious to them. I can see his, this deer is just, I can see him licking his lips. Just, he was probably just waiting for me to leave the orchard so he could just come out and start eating the trees. How do we control deer? Well, some people suggest that the permanent solution, the lead solution is the best way to go by shooting them. But uh, another strategy, and a, also a very reliable strategy, is fencing. <clears throat> Unfortunately, an eight-foot fence is needed for deer, um, and preferably electrified. But the people at United Tribes did not want me to electrify the fence or put up a fence around the orchard. So then you're, you have to use repellents. So again, for wildlife, a barrier is the best way to go but otherwise a repellent can help. And so I use liquid fence and liquid fence contains uh, guts of animals, tankage we call it, and sulfur, smells like sulfur, rotten eggs. Anything that smells like a rotten body works very effectively because the, the deer, when they, when they lick the branches before they eat them, they get a scent of that rotten flesh and then they know there's a, they sense there's a predator nearby. And so they, they, they learn to stay away from the orchard. And I, I have to say, I was very impressed with liquid fence in that, uh, yeah, I even remember one night going out to the orchard and I saw a whole herd of deer grazing around the orchard. So they were not interested in those apple trees after they were trained to stay out. So how about, are there any questions before we start talking about Pest management, does anybody have any questions about establishing the orchard, getting it going? Tom, there were a few questions that have come in. Okay. Um, from Judy, why do apples need to be attached to a root stock? Okay, uh, a lot of it has to do with hardiness and vigor. So like a standard root stock, like that Dolgo crab, is, a, is from Russia, and so that Antonovka, it's from Russia. It will give a greater hardiness to, let's say, the Honeycrisp apple 
if you attach it to that rootstock. So it, it, it really has to do with hardiness and vigor of the plant. Now, you can't, you like you could plant, you could uh, take a cutting from a, a honey crisp and use it as rootstock, but it wouldn't have that same number, that same amount of hardiness. And the other thing, another reason why we use a rootstock is it allows us to, to have a rootstock that will keep the tree dwarf so that we, we don't have to worry about a honey crisp tree growing 30 feet or taller. We can put it on a, let's say a semi dwarf rootstock and that rootstock will naturally limit the height of the tree to about 12 to 15 feet. Okay, Tara wants to know if you have a preference for what you use for mulch. Okay, uh, shredded bark is good for me if it's available. The most, you know, and I would just say, you know, when we get to larger orchards, the most important thing is um, just keep the turf away. But in a small orchard, I love shredded bark. That's great. Or wood chips, they're, they're just as good. They're just as good. Okay, and the final question so far comes from Judy. Can you review how new apple varieties are created since the apple seeds of a given apple variety do not ensure that it will produce the same variety apple when planted? Well, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that's true because an apple, let's say a Honeycrisp apple cannot be pollinated by another Honeycrisp apple. So, so when you, so that pollen comes from a different type of parent. So when you take the seeds out of a Honeycrisp apple, you have no idea what kind of uh, apple it's going to develop. That that seed when it grows into a tree, it will, we know who the mother is. The mother was a Honeycrisp, but we have no idea who the father is because we don't know where, where the bee got the pollen from, and it could be from a crab apple, it could be from whatever. So now, actually, this takes me back to my days at Minnesota. I, I lived right next to the the epicenter of apple breeding. I was I did my master's research at uh, the University of Minnesota Horticulture Research Center in a uh, Chanhassen area, where and that's the that's the birthplace of Honeycrisp and lots of apples there. It's amazing how they you know you had they, they as a breeder. You have to control the pollen. So let's say let's say we have a variety. Let's just throw out a hazen variety. See, I wonder how a hazen. If I crossed a hazen with a honeycrisp, I wonder how it would, would be. Well, you visit manually. Take a hazen flower with the pollen, or you take the pollen from the hazen, and you have to pollinate by hand that honeycrisp flower, and you have to close the restrict the pollen so no bee gets in there to mess it up. And then now you get that it forms an apple. So now I, I know I got a hazen honey crisp cross. I'm going to plant out those seeds and it's going to take many years. It's going to take 10 years before you know whether or not anything you did is going to amount to anything. And so they, you know, they, they view out Dave Bedford out there. He has tasted hundreds, countless hundreds of apples and, Actually, even the Honeycrisp apple almost got, I think I heard once that it was supposed to be, uh, that planting was supposed to be destroyed because it wasn't, it wasn't, didn't taste good in the very beginning, but they never got around to digging up that planting. And then later Dave came out there and he said, wow, that's a really great apple. I think I'm going to make this one famous. So it's really, it's so time consuming. It takes years and years, 10 years or longer, hit or miss, and you know, over 99% are failures. How's that for life? That takes a lot of dedication. So that's a lot of work and it's slow. And, but when you hit the jackpot, you hit the jackpot. Because once you, once you discover the honey crisp, you can take cuttings from it and have, and just multiply it that way. Good question. Okay, one last question and then we'll let you go on. Okay. What is the ideal and maximum spacing for standard size and semi-dwarf trees needing cross-pollination? Okay, well, as far as uh, the planting between the trees, if it's a standard size tree, I plant them at about 23 feet apart. If it's a semi-dwarf tree, I plant them at about 15 feet apart. And uh, and also you got to keep in, into mind your farm equipment and your ability to get the sprayer between the rows too. 
Um, you can plant them a little bit farther apart if you want. It depends on how much, you know, how precious the land is. As far as pollination goes, usually when you plant a large orchard, you will plant them in such that you will have, uh, let's say you'll have two rows of Honeycrisp, then one row of a Harrelson, two rows of a Honeycrisp, one row of a Harrelson. So the pollen will always be, it's, it should be at least within a hundred feet of it. You know, you should have at least a hundred feet of a different variety nearby. And sometimes people, if they don't plant in rows like that, they'll have a, they'll just have every third tree be a different variety. Cause you have to have different pollination. Excuse me. That's a good question. So like, even like when you think about your backyard, you should have a, you should have a crab apple or another variety within a hundred feet to get good pollination because that, that brings up a good point, Julie, that, you know, you got to plant at least two different cultivars because one cultivar will reject its own pollen. Good questions. Any other out there? Um, we'll come back to it. There's a couple more, okay. but we'll let you keep going. Okay. I'll keep going. Let's talk about, uh, controlling pests because pests are a big problem with apples and we're talking about diseases and insect pests and I think a lot of us when we think about controlling pests we automatically think about spraying chemicals but actually sanitation is of prime importance in the orchard whether it's a backyard orchard or a big orchard because the diseases and insect pests can overwinter on fruit and leaf litter so at the end of the year, it's very important that you collect the, the fallen fruits or the fallen leaves or at least mow them to prevent the, the pests, whether it's a disease or insects from overwintering and infecting the tree the following year. So again, think about raking, if it's a small orchard, raking is just as important as thinking about spraying or at least mow underneath the trees. If it's a, if we're worried about diseases, fungicides, common, we're going to use fungicides and the most common one to use are Captan, Mancozeb early in the season or for organic growers, wettable sulfurs use. The key is you got to use it when the buds break because that's when the infections occur is in springtime when the buds are just breaking. So if I'm just going to spray my orchard three times with a fungicide, I'm going to spray when the buds break, just start to emerge and then follow by every seven to 10 days. And just like if I could just do three sprays, I can control a lot of the diseases in the orchard that way. For, and here's the most, the most killing disease is fire blight. So we gotta talk about that. Fire blight is shown, this is a classic symptom of a, a hook or a shepherd's crook, we say at the end of the branch and the branch looks torched, okay? This is a bacteria, it's in the wood, there's only one way to control it and that is to cut it out. Cut that wood out of the orchard. And you need to go, the most modern techniques is what we use is what we call the ugly stub treatment. So what we do is we get in the orchard as soon as we see the symptoms and we try to cut out all the, all the blackened, the scorched wood and then go at least eight inches beyond that and preferably 12 to 15 inches beyond that. We prune back to a stub. We don't prune back to the branch. We, we leave a stub. And the stub should be about four inches or more, and the wood should be at least two years old. And what we found is that any fire blight bacterium that we didn't cut out in our first cut will accumulate in that stub. We paint the stub, you know, after, after we make it the stub, and like a fluorescent orange paint or whatever, and then we go out there in winter and we cut off the stub. So that's the most effective tool against fire blight, which is a killer in, in orchards. Okay, lastly with bugs, some common insecticides would be malathion or if you're an organic grower, neem. Um, other ones, uh, carbaryl is sometimes used later in the season to control insects or maybe pyrethrins. I see a uh, home fruit orchard products with that. So those insecticides are available, but the timing is key. And also, if you don't want to be spraying a lot and you're just a small scale grower or backyard grower, consider the use of traps to monitor for the pest. The other thing is the last few words are after the petals fall. Okay, there's no sense in protecting fruits 
before the fruits are formed. So that's after pollination. And we don't want to spray until the petals have fallen because then the bees will all be gone and we don't want to harm any honeybees. So wait till after the petals fall and then we have to consider insect management. And you need to know the insect pest you're going after. And in our limited amount of time, I'll just briefly talk about the most common one. And this is the apple maggot. And this is caused by a fly who lays her eggs into the fruit the eggs hatch and then they create these little tunnels into the fruit. It's the most common insect pest in North Dakota. It's also not that difficult to control because the fly doesn't even emerge until early July, like the 4th of July. It wakes up from the fireworks and here it comes. It's ready to lay its eggs. And so we can track for that. We don't have to spray ahead of time. We can set up these sticky traps and there's uh, the apple maggot traps are available online and at major garden centers. They're covered with the sticky material. The fly, when she emerges on the 4th of July, she'll be attracted to the red color because she's looking for a ripe fruit and all the other fruits will be green. And so you can just go out to your orchard starting, you can put these up in late June and just inspect your trees. Just put a few of them up in each tree especially on the sunny parts of the tree, like on the west or south side, and especially near a brushy area, that, that would help too. And just go out there and, and, and monitor for the pest. If you don't see any, any, uh, any maggot flies, that means there's no maggots around, so we don't have to be spraying. But then if once those maggot flies do appear, then you know, that's when you have to make your decision as far as how you're gonna manage the pest. And, you know, are you going to manage the pest and use insecticide or do you want, are you just going to have like applesauce with your apples? It's your choice. But traps are available to monitor for pests. Okay, I'm going to just uh, wrap up with a talk on, with some important facts on pruning. And I, I want to focus a little bit on pruning because this is badly needed and um, now it's the time to do it. It's perfect timing. We should prune our apple trees every winter, every winter. And the whole key to pruning when you prune is to think about, I want to get as much sun and wind movement into the canopy. Also pruning can get the dead wood out and keep the height of the tree manageable. Unfortunately, this is a very common apple tree in North Dakota. Lots of backyards have trees just like this, never pruned. Uh, we all enjoy the spring blossoms and then we just hope we get a few fruits and then when, when the fruits fall down or we shake the tray and we pick up the fruits, we just hope and pray that the maggots weren't visiting that year. That's not the way to do it. Here's another look at it. There's, there's just no, there's, this is gonna be poor quality apples, if any, from these trees. I could spend a whole hour talking about apple pruning, but we're not gonna. I'm gonna give you just a very quick, uh, 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 the short version of it. I wanna say, I'll emphasize one point, is that a lot of times people are hesitant to prune because they feel like they're, 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 they're not confident in doing it. They think they're gonna screw up and they're gonna kill the tree somehow. Don't worry about it, it's just a tree, you know? It'll, it'll survive. And uh, you're in control, you got the pruners. Go ahead and start, start going after it. And even if you just, even if you're hesitant, just if nothing else, take out these vertical shoots called water sprouts. Okay, anything vertical is not fruitful. Anything vertical is not fruitful. These water sprouts, all they do is clutter up the tree, prevent good air movement, prevent sunlight. Just take out the water sprouts. If people would just do that every year, you'd have a much better apple crop and you don't have to think about it. And also I see like towards this top center of the tree, you can see this, this, this branch moving inward. Take out any branches that are growing inward. We want the branches to grow outward. Okay, it's really, it's not rocket science. And don't worry, the tree will be fine. There you go. Just get out there. Here's a vertical water sprout, just with leaf buds on it, no fruit buds. It's not gonna produce any wood. Let's get it, any fruits, let's get it out. I'll just quickly go over a few key points. And again, this is in the handout that I have for you. Take out the suckers. Suckers are... They just clutter up the tree, the bottom of the tree. They do nothing good for the tree. 
Next, take out the water sprouts. Those thin shoots are just like pencils that come up. They don't produce fruit. They just clutter up the tree. In the big picture, we want a young tree to be trained so it's like a Christmas tree, a, like a pyramid where the widest branches are at the bottom. So, for example, if you have up here a branch that's going to shade the lower branch, cut, trim it back. And when you trim back a, a tree, an apple tree, you cut it just above an outward facing bud. Again, we want the tree to grow outward. Okay. Take out vertical branches. They're not fruitful. We want to have the tree stop at about 12 to 15 feet tall not any higher than that because it's too hard to manage. So don't let branches get taller than the leader branch. Cut them out. Any branches that are growing inward, take them out. They just clutter up the tree. And any branches that are drooping or horizontal, they will be fruitful, but the problem is they're not sturdy. When you get a fruit load on them, those branches will drop. They'll just crack. And so... Ideally, we're looking for like what we call a 60 degree angle or two o'clock, 10 o'clock. Those are the strongest branches for us. Open up the canopy. I like this drawing in that before we see all that wood in there, but after a while, look how open it is. You know, if you're not sure whether you're, you're done pruning or not, it means you're not done. Keep going. Open that up. And a lot of times after I prune a tree, I go, wow, I really did a number on that guy. But you come back in the summer and you look at it, wow, it really fills in nicely. And there's lots of sunlight in that tree. The apples are going to be bright red and the leaves are going to be rich green. So get in there and thin out, open up that tree. An orchardist in Wisconsin gave me a tip once. He said, Tom, if you're not sure whether or not you're done, you're not done you should be able to pick up a rangy farm cat and throw it through the tree. If the cat gets stuck, you gotta keep pruning. There you go. Now, of course, I would never recommend throwing a cat in a tree. That's just not right. You know, you can break a lot of branches that way, so don't do that. But on the other hand, another way we can do it without worrying about cats is there's an old saying about you should allow a, a robin should be able to fly through the tree in the early springtime. So those are some tips. Open up the tree and get it some sunlight. Let's say lastly, if you got an old tree, what do we do? Again, the same principle. We want to open up the canopy, get more sun in it. Get rid of the dead wood, get rid of those branches crossing over, and get rid of those water sprouts, those vertical branches. And lastly, that apple tree, if it's an old tree and neglected, it's probably 25 feet tall. It's, you can't manage those kind of trees, so reduce their height. And here's a diagram of how we're going to cut out some of that central trunk. We've got to bring that tree down, and we're going to look for some vigorous scaffold branches. Ones that, not, not the oldest branches, but maybe about eight inches, and uh, lustrous wood, still young wood, young, sturdy branches. That's ideally what we're looking for, and we'll have a tree something like this. Or sometimes in the oldest orchards, like really a well-managed orchard uh, it really, it's not gonna, it's not gonna live more than 40 years before the trees lose their productivity. But in some of these really old orchards, these heirloom orchards, you see these old trees that are more than 40 years old. And over time, we try to keep the height low and they develop more into like an umbrella shape. So I see this in a lot of old orchards, which you could find still in North Dakota. So maybe that would be the kind of way an old apple tree would look, but still could be managed. Okay, I want to thank all the photographers for making their photos available through Creative Commons. And I don't know, does anybody have any questions? I'd be happy to answer them. Okay, there were several questions that came. Okay, in. here we go. <laughs> um, from Kay, isn't the hazen on its own rootstock naturally semi-dwarf and developed in North Dakota? Okay, uh, yes and no. Hazen is from North Dakota. Hazen is naturally a semi-dwarf rootstock. And I, 
personally, I think that's about its only good quality. Um, but when you buy a hazen, it will not be on its own rootstock. It will probably be on a Dolgo crab rootstock. That's by far the most common one in North Dakota. Okay, uh, another Julie in the audience says, the apples on my Harrelson have black spots on them every year. They still taste good. I just cut the, the spots out, but what causes these? Okay, if they're a black, blackish spot, there is a, a disease called sooty blotch and fly speck. And the sooty blotch looks like ashen blotches. The fly speck looks, they come in clusters of tiny like black pinpricks. It looks like about 30 or more pinpricks all right next to each other. And those diseases often uh, come together. Harrelson's very susceptible to that. So it's a fungus disease. So what are we gonna do about it? Okay, I think that first of all, anything we can do before early spring to rake or mow underneath the tree can help reduce the presence of that fungus. But then the most important, most important thing for that is you got to prune the tree to get more air and sunlight because sooty blotch and fly speck love humidity. And that's, that's when I see it most common. It's in a tree that's not being pruned hard enough. Um, also, if, the, if the, in some cases, underneath the tree, there's not any air movement. It's maybe too grassy. The grass is too tall. So make sure you mow underneath the tree and uh, you can prevent the spread of sooty blotch and fly speck by fungicides, all the ones we talked about, cattan is most common, or um, sulfur for an organic product. That can help. And you would be a commercial orchard. We spray all every two weeks from uh, bud break to near harvest time. So... It depends on how extreme you want to go, but for, but usually the, we can handle that problem just by being more aggressive in our pruning. All right, then someone asked about the name of the publication for fruit pests, which I went back into your presentation, but I just want to be sure that I, I got it right. The Midwest yeah. Home Fruit Production Guide, Cultural Practices and Pest Management. Is that correct? Yeah. There's 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 a bunch of them. If you're really into pest management, the most extensive one is the Midwest Fruit Pest um, Fruit Pest Guide. Midwest Fruit Pest Guide, in, and it covers detailed information about insect and disease control. It lists all the fungicides, all the all the bactericides, all the insecticides, and how to how to use them properly. If you're looking for more general information that Midwest Fruit Production Guide from Produce Good, or I like those Wisconsin guides too. Are both of those on the internet? Yes, everything's online for free. If you want, and they're also available for purchase, and you can get, you can buy a copy if you want, but it's all online for free. Okay, we'll try to get those linked on our website with Tom's presentation. Um, here's Minnesota Joe S. For newly grafted baby trees, rootstock branches are fighting with new scion growth to be main leader. How should I prune to rootstock growth to prevent from becoming leader while still trying to maximize photosynthetic potential for the very young tree? Okay, so the rootstocks are, the, the sprouts in the rootstock are surpassing the scion, is that, I guess that's what Joe's asking. Yes, yes. So, okay, you can't, okay, the whole, the whole thing, the most important thing is what branch is at the top, is at the apex, the apex, because that will give the apical, apical dominance and that will get special hormones. So you just can't allow that rootstock to get taller than the, 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 the branches of the, the rootstock to get taller than the branches of the scion. You just can't allow that. So just prune it out. Um, Trinity Gardens asks how many fruit maggot traps they need. Okay, it depends on the tree, the size of the tree, and depends on the, the situation. Um, okay, for a standard size tree, let's say five traps would be great if you could do that, but at least three would be nice. And focus on them on the sunnier parts of the tree. 
on, and on trees near brushy areas where the maggots are most likely to enter the orchard first. If it's a large planting, then we focus the, the maggot traps along the border of the planting because that's, that's more likely where the maggots are going to come from. Okay, so the sunny areas of the tree. If it's a, if it's a dwarf or semi-dwarf, three traps would certainly be enough. Larger trees, maybe five would be I'd better. And here's a question from Judy. She says, you mentioned that you need to have another variety of apple or crab apple tree near your yard apple tree to have pollination. Given this, how can you ensure that the apple tree initially purchased from a nursery and planted in your yard will continue to produce the selected apples of the type of apple tree that was initially selected? Okay. <clears throat> Let's say when you buy, let's say our friend Hazen, when you buy a Hazen apple tree that will always produce Hazen apples because the fruit tissue is asexual. It's not affected by the pollen. It's maternal tissue. It's Hazen tissue. Now, let's say you got a, let's say you got a honey crisp planted with your Hazen. The hazen will always produce a hazen apple, but the seed inside the hazen apple will be affected by the nearby honey crisp. So, so it's the seed that's the issue because that's sexual, sexually propagated. So in the nursery trade, we never, you know, unless you're Dave Bedford at the University of Minnesota, the only, we only use cuttings. We only use hazen cuttings. We never take seeds outside of hazen apples to, uh, to grow hazen apples. You can't. Okay, so it's, it's maternal tissue. The fruit that we eat is maternal tissue. It's not sexual. And here's a question from Jen R. What should I do to the soil to ensure growth? We purchased trees last year and they did not make it. We were wondering if it was the soil. Wow. Um, okay. All right. I, okay, here's the ideal situation is before you plant an orchard, you get a soil test. And even in your, and like right now, like as soon as that ground thaws out, get out there, do a soil test, do a general soil test. Uh, for a plant like an, uh, as adaptable as an apple is in North Dakota, I'd be surprised if the, if the soil was the problem. I really, I don't think the soil was the problem. Something else happened there. It was, uh, if it dies right away, it's uh, improper watering or the roots were rotten to begin with. Um, there's, it's such a harsh climate in North Dakota. Maybe something happened there. Or maybe it was, a, maybe, maybe if you bought it from um, a less than ideal place, it, the, the roots may have been rotten or if it, it was a, big box store, maybe the roots were rotten from overwatering. But I'd be really surprised if the soil was the issue. That's, you know, what, what, would, what would that be? It would be like pH, it'd be too alkaline. And that would have to be so extreme. You'd have to have like the worst soil in North Dakota for that to happen. And what you would see, your, the leaves would be yellow with green veins. So I doubt if that's what you saw. As long as it's too, Proper drainage, that's the most important thing. But let me also throw in a last second. It never hurts to do a soil test. That is valuable information that can help you manage the soil and usually save money on fertilizer because we have a tendency to over fertilize our plants. And I have one more question for you. Okay. This comes from Minnesota Joe. Which varieties have the best growth habits to lend themselves well to espalier? Oh, wow. <laughs> Keeping you on your toes. <laughs> uh, Joe, I don't know. I, you know what? I've never grown an apple spalier style. And I think just about anyone would do the job if you're willing to do it. Pears are more famous for espalier. Um, you know what? When I select an apple, the thing I'm most concerned about is its hardiness. That would be the thing I'd be most concerned with. And... Uh, 
Maybe for a, a spallier apple, I would also, I just myself, I would consider maybe a, a smaller shape, a smaller fruited apple, maybe a, like a chestnut crab apple, maybe try that. But I think almost any variety would work. All right, well, I'll, I will draw to a close and I wanna thank everyone for participating and I especially wanna thank Tom for a very entertaining and very educational presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you everybody. And if anybody has any questions as springtime rolls on, please feel free to ask me. You can find me via email. I'd be happy to help you. And Bob has just let us know that the links to Tom's slides, the a handout, the fruit production guide, and the fruit pest management guide are available on the Field to Fork webinar. And his presentation will be archived within the week. So thank you again, everybody, and please take the survey. <laughs> and thanks to Bob, and thanks to you, Julie, too. You guys are great. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks a lot. Welcome.